Welcome to Everything Life and Real Estate. Let's get started with our hosts, Linda McKissick and Dana Gentry. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Everything Life and Real Estate. I'm Linda McKissick. And I'm Dana Gentry. Good morning, Dana. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. How are you? I'm great. Hey, I'm super excited because you and I met an amazing gentleman a few weeks ago at John Maxwell, and we both said he was our highlight, yes. <laughs> the number one, the thing we got the most, the talk we enjoyed the most. And so uh, we used uh, our, our, our skills of sales and we talked him into being on our podcast today. So uh, welcome Jeff Henderson. And Jeff has written a book called Four. And Jeff, why don't you kind of kick us off and tell us a little bit about uh, you and your background. I loved everything about your background, by the way. Yes. Uh, so tell everybody a little bit about your background and then kind of your book. Well, thanks, Linda and Dana. I'm trying to record that intro to send it to John Maxwell, if that's okay. So, <laughs> We've but, got um, 103 of them, so we can send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, yes, yeah, so I, I, I grew up, um, I'm a preacher's kid, so I, you know, kind of grew up in the church and promised myself I would never work at a church, but really developed an interest in marketing. And I was a big sports fan, still am a big sports fan. And I discovered in college that you could do something called sports marketing. And who, what a great country. So I ended up working for the Atlanta Braves in marketing. Eventually, uh, uh, many years later, worked for Chick-fil-A and managed their regional marketing, which um, obviously was, uh, it was primarily, you know, in 36 states at the time. And I did sports marketing for them and loved it. But uh, 17 years ago, my wife and I were very involved in a church and we were asked to help launch eventually three churches over the last 17 years um, in the Atlanta area. Um, but in the meantime, I've, I've, kind of, I've kind of been in both worlds, Linda and Dana. I love the business world. I love the nonprofit world. And I began to discover that there's a lot that the nonprofit leaders could learn from business leaders like you. But what I also discovered is that there, were, there was a lot that business leaders could learn from nonprofit leaders. And so as I, as I began to reflect, I was telling a mentor of mine that, wow, I've been really fortunate to work for two thriving organizations, Chick-fil-A, which mm. is a multi-billion dollar organization that has achieved same store sales growth for the last 51 years, which is unheard of. Then North Point Ministries, which was recently named the largest church in America, and I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a large th growing organization. And I told my, one of my mentors, what a cool opportunity. I got to, to work for two thriving, one a business and one nonprofit. And he pushed back a little bit and said, well, it, it is a blessing and you are fortunate, but it's a stewardship responsibility. You need to tell the rest of us what you learned. Mm -hmm. How did these two organizations grow? Because you were on the front lines. And I thought, wow, okay. Um, and he said, if you can boil it down to half a piece of paper, that would be great. So whether it's a real estate agent, whether it's a chicken uh, company, or whether it's a church, um, what did you learn? And so I really boiled it down to the two questions of the book. And that's kind of how I got here. Yeah. Awesome. I love it. I'm actually doing a, a, a vision retreat this afternoon for one of my market center leadership teams. And we're the entire four hour retreat is going to be around nothing but uh, your message <laughs> because, okay. oh, it's so powerful. I'm, I'd be embarrassed to show you, but I've made like a little PowerPoint of all of your stuff from the event because it was just, I know Linda and I, she wasn't kidding when she said that earlier. We were like, we've got to get this to everybody in our world because it, it was, it was so good. Um, I would and, love for you to send me that PowerPoint, Dana. That would be yeah, awesome. There you go. Hey, be a Dana, lot of work. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Leverage it out. There you go. You're, there's your new PowerPoint you'll be showing next week at your event or wherever you're teaching. Yeah, I will. I will. Linda, you want to go first? Awesome. Yeah. I, you know, I have to tell you, I, we could go for days because there's just so many places I could start with this. But one of the first things I want to talk about in your book is when you talked about uh, Truett Cathy's uh, world view of how you know when someone needs encouragement, mm -hmm. if they're breathing. So kind of talk a little bit about that, if you would. Was it was true? Do you think it was true? It's um, because Chick-fil-A is another company that I just admire so much. Uh, and I do believe that they've got God's provision on them for being such good stewards and all those things. But I also wonder, you know, was it true? It is he the original? Was it the kind of people he attracted? What 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 built Chick-fil-A to be like they are? 
Truett taught all of us, but one of the things he shared with me is to take advantage of unexpected opportunities. Mm. And so I think it's easy to look in, in hindsight and think, well, Truett came up with this chicken sandwich and he knew that, you know, years later it would be a multi-billion dollar company. That's not true. Truett would say, no, what I did is I discovered that, you know, I bet if I put this seasoned chicken on uh, between two pieces of bread and put two pickles on it, let's see if it works. And what a lot of people don't realize is that for the next, don't miss this Linda and Dana and everyone else listening, for the next 19 years, one, nine, 19 years, he perfected um, his chicken sandwich and did not launch the first Chick-fil-A until 19 years later. And so some people might say Truett Cathy was an overnight success uh, that took 19 years, you know. Um, And I think that's a helpful reminder because I think for many of us, sometimes we feel like we're behind. For many of us, we feel like we should be further along than we are. Mm -hmm. And we we look at the highlight reels of of business leaders like Truett and and honestly, business leaders like the both of you and think, oh, it just is easier for them or look at how much success they have and I just feel behind. And especially on social media, you see the highlight reels of people. You don't really see the back behind the scenes story. And and when you begin to understand with Truett, um, uh, one of his first restaurants closed, Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, burned down. Um, His brother, Ben, that he went into business with was killed in a plane crash. Mm -hmm. Um, And you begin to see all these hurdles that he had to get, get through that. Um, But at the end of the day, he began to discover that business was a platform to serve people really, really well. And he also understood that the more profit he had, the more purpose he could fuel. Um, And I love doing business with Chick-fil-A because I know that I feel like every time I get a combo number one, the world gets to be a little bit better because that money's gonna be used in a a wise manner. And so for Truett, he was genuinely uh, to use the book title, I apologize, genuinely for others. Mm-hmm. And, and the book actually opens with me driving Truett to a speaking engagement. Mm-hmm. And it was one of the first times that we, he and I had had, you know, just, I mean, I'd been around Truett a bunch, but just one-on-one time in a car, you know. First of all, I'm scared to death because I don't want to have a wreck, you know, and injure Truett Kathy. I don't want that to be my 15 minutes of fame, you know. <laughs> And, but I began to, you know, I figured we would talk about the business and we did, but at the, at some point in the conversation, it turned and it began, there were questions like, Hey, do you like working here? Does your wife, Wendy, does she feel like you're a better husband by being around us? Um, we started talking about being a good dad and I began to discover that Truett was genuinely interested in me. Mm. And that's when I discovered the secret to how he grew the business. And I think this is a secret to any growing business. Ultimately, I mean, there can be flash in the pans and you can have, you know, a few good years, but I'm talking about sustained growth, 51 years of same store sales growth, that kind of growth. And what I began to discover, the secret is that Truett was more interested in the business growing people than Mm -hmm. he was people growing the business. Mm -hmm. And that's how the business grew. Well, and that leads to one of your points in there that says, if you will focus on the customer and talk more about the customer, they'll talk more about your business. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it's really a, a, what I call a four ethos, a mm-hmm. culture, a, a, a genuine, <clears throat> authentic, we are genuinely for you. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so many churches are doing the four campaign now, which is very uh, encouraging to see, but I have to tell them it's, it's not a bunch of bumper stickers and t-shirts. I mean, that's part of it, but yeah. If you are genuinely not, if you're not genuinely hopeful that your organization is going to make your community a better place, please don't do this <laughs> because it's going to come across as a gimmick. Mm-hmm. And that's why it has to be. That's why you have to, gen- this is a heart issue. This is, a, yeah. this, and I know we don't like to talk many, one of the reasons I love about y'all, you, you're not shy of this. It's a soul issue. Absolutely. You know, what's the soul of the business? And I know a business doesn't necessarily have a soul, but the people do. And what, what is the, and that's when I was at the church, I, at the very start of the early parts of the church, I would say, hey, if our church ever closed down, I would want the community to rise up and protest that. Mm-hmm. Because you are adding so much value to our community that we suffer if you go out of business. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is, is a lot of churches and a lot of businesses close every day and the community never notices because they weren't genuinely adding value to the, the community. And that's why I think it's so exciting to, to, to meet business leaders like, like you, because I really do believe doing good is good for business. I, I, I don't say that because I'm a, you know, pastor or whatever. I really genuinely believe yeah. that. And I think the marketing research is showing us that. Yeah, I so believe that. You, that actually, Jeff, you just walked right into one of my questions. Well, one, we don't want to give away the whole book because we want them to go and buy and read your book. Um, and I would love for you to share the two questions. But also, and also, you said something um, that I loved. A business is no longer what it tells customers it is. A business is what customers tell other customers that it is. And mm -hmm. I'd love for you to just speak about that. Sure. That's, we all know the most powerful form of advertising Yesterday, today, and tomorrow is word of mouth advertising. And it's what customers talk, what, what they say about you. But the challenge is, is that you have to give them something to say. Mm. And, and I put in the book, and this sounds a little uh, uh, negative, so, so bear with me. But um, if a business was a person, many businesses would be considered narcissists. Because if you look at their social media feed, it's all about them and look how better than they are than their competition and we're so amazing. And we drift away from people like that. And I think what we're discovering is customers drift away from people like that as well. And so what we want to do is we want to wow our customers. We want to deliver wow. We want to you know, have a closing that is just unlike any closing ever before that they have to share. You're not going to believe what they did. It was so thoughtful. It was so for me. I don't, and the question, this is one of the things I, 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 I told our staff at the church. I want us to do things that people ask us the question, why are you doing this? Like what's in it for yeah. you? Yeah. And I love, I love that. And that requires some thought. It sometimes requires a little investment, not all the time, but more mm -hmm. often it requires thought and it requires heart. But when you do that, it's remarkable and customers have a, create a business or they, they become a raving fan of the business. Um, and the business becomes what I call remark able, mm -hmm. that they are able to be remarked about to their, to their customers. And, um, and so that's Dana to your point. And if you want to get into the two questions, kind of yeah. leave that, that's okay. So um, when I was in advertising school, uh, you know, the professor said, Hey, we know that word of mouth advertising is, you know, the greatest form of advertising, but we don't know how to, to do that. So we're going to spend the rest of the semester on paid advertising. And I'll have to say this and pause. I do believe in paid advertising um, if you can afford it. But at the end of the day, as you said, Dana, it's not about what a business says about the business. It's what other customers tell customers about the business. That's, that's the ball game. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I call word of mouth advertising is creating vision carriers. The more vision carriers you have for your business, the more vision casters you have. So, for example, when, when I launched these churches, if somebody were to say, hey, we'll give you a bunch of money to create the coolest website in the world, or we'll give you 50 people to tell other, their friends about your church, hands down, I'll figure out the website, but I got to have those 50 people because they have more credibility than me. But the, the question then is, is how do you create those vision carriers and how do you get them talking about your business? Well, it comes down to these two questions. And this goes back to my mentor saying, if you could put it on half a piece of paper and just give it to us, what would it be? And I saw this at Chick-fil-A, I saw this at North Point, and I see this in other organizations. Question number one is, what do you want to be known for? Mm. That's, your, that's what you bring uniquely to the marketplace. I mean, sure, there are a lot of chicken sandwiches, but what do you bring? Sure, there are a lot of real estate agents and companies, but what do you uniquely bring? When they talk about you, or when they talk about your restaurant, or when they talk about your organization, what do you want to be known for? And it can't be a 17 paragraph mission statement um, because there's the, there's the clarity about that. And then there's the wordsmithing as well. And both of those are, go hand in hand. And both of those are a lot of hard work. Uh, the, the, the good news about what do you want to be known for is it's a simple question. The bad news about that question is that it's not an easy question. Mm -hmm. It seems easy. And the reason I know it's not easy is because when I go into organizations and help them, I pass out pieces of paper and ask everyone on the leadership team or whoever I'm meeting with to write down quietly what they think the organization wants to be known for. And then I collect them and read them. And typically you begin to see a divergent of thought here. 
and that there's confusion in the leadership team or there's confusion in the office space about what we wanted to be done for. And that that's totally normal, but it's it's not going to lead you to where you want to go because if there's confusion in the office space, there will be confusion in the marketplace, hands down. So what do you want to be known for? And I think what you're doing today, Dana, in terms of the offsite afternoon retreat, all that's really important because you got to talk about this. Mm-hmm. But so that's what that's your question to wrestle with, though. Uh, the bad news is, is the second question or the challenging news is the second question. And the second question is yours to influence, but it's not yours to answer. And the second question is, what are you known for? Mm-hmm. So that is the customer's question. And that's the one that they get to reflect back to you on whether or not you and I are delivering on what I would call our brand promise. So here's what we want to be known for. Then we have to take the have to have courage to go. Okay, let's pull the rock up and look at the squiggly things underneath it, and to see if we're actually delivering on what we want to be known for. But here's the power of those two questions: when what you want to be known for, your unique vision, what you bring unique to the marketplace or your community or your customer, when what you want to be known for is what you're known for then you create vision carriers. You create a sales force for free. You harness the power of word of mouth advertising because now people have experienced your unique vision, how you have created a unique closing or how you not only served a great product, but it was a great product and you wowed them all the way through the customer's buying experience. And they tell other people about you. Over the course of time, that's how a business sustains growth. Um, Again, as I mentioned, there can be flashes of brilliance for a few couple of years, but if you're not wowing the customer, um, they're not going to have anything to say about you. So the question, though, before us then is, here's the reality for all of us. There's a gap. There's a gap in any organization between what you want to be known for and what you are known for. And so what the rest of the book does, Linda and Dana, is to teach you how to close the gap so that you can leverage um, the power of word of mouth advertising. Because the problem we're trying to solve is business growth as it relates to the lack thereof of word of mouth advertising. Mm -hmm. And if we can solve that problem and get people talking about you and recommending your business to others, that's the ballgame. Yeah. Tonight when I do, I'm actually going to do that exercise tonight with my team and I have these little pieces of paper for them to answer what we want to be known for and then what they think that we are right now. And I've been a little nervous, but I'm also excited to hear their responses because that's truly, this is the theme of our meeting tonight. So, um, first of all, kudos to you for doing this. Secondly, probably there might be some gaps and those are, that's okay. You know why? Because you're a human being, I'm a human being, Linda's a human being, there's no perfect organizations. Yeah. But what you're doing is, is you're having the courage to go after that and figure out what the, where the gaps are. Yeah. So a couple of thoughts, a couple of thoughts on, on what you just said. Did I have an echo? Uh, you said that, um, so if I hear you correctly, then when they get clear on their mission statement, their mission statement should match what they're for, right? Is that is that what I heard you say? And right. then Another thing that came uh, to mind that I wanted your input on was, to me, uh, I believe this is something that you get better at over time. I mean, someone might be listening to this and go, I don't feel like I'm true at Kathy and do all that naturally. And we tend to do that. We tend to look at, you know, somebody else's outsides and compare our insides. But I know from my own experience, over time, this to me, this gets easier. And when you talk about looking, you know, to do those things that they go, wow, why are you doing that? I think it, you have to listen. You have to learn to listen for it. It's like a muscle. And once you get in the habit of doing that, don't you, do, would you say that it would get easier and easier for people? It's the more they work to, to write their organization in this direction. And, and what do you think for people Absolutely. that are listening that says, I, I'm not even close to doing this? Absolutely. So I was, I was in Tulsa last week with Jill Donovan. Maybe y'all met Jill at Exchange. She is the CEO of Rustic Cuff. Yeah, she's awesome. And so I spoke to their team. And when you walk into their organization, they have this big sign that says, don't compare your chapter one to mm-hmm. someone else's chapter 20. 
Love, oh, I love it. Yeah, we Linda, we got her beautiful bracelets. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think many times we compare, you know, let's just pick through it. His chapter 30 to my chapter one. Mm. And I would say, especially for the listeners that are starting, maybe you're starting a new and maybe you're starting in real estate or you're, you're starting in, you're starting over. Um, don't despise the days of humble beginnings. That's a biblical principle. Yeah. And the great thing about humble beginnings and simple, you know, those early days is you get to dream, but don't put the pressure on, on trying to have all the answers. Um, it's a process. It's a journey. For example, when we launched for Gwinnett, which I was at Gwinnett Church in Atlanta, uh, a lot of people said, what is that? And I said, well, I've got some thoughts because as, as it relates to the church, I mean, if I just talk about that for a second, we, the problem we were trying to solve is that many people are more familiar with what the church is against rather than what the church is for. Mm -hmm. So I said, here's what I think it is, but here's the journey we're about to go on. For the next few years, we get to discover what Fort Gwinnett really is. Mm -hmm. So let's not, let's not get it too black and white right now. Let's discover and go on this process together. So I totally agree with you, Linda. I think every business leader, I know every pastor, every entrepreneur has, well, every, every human being has, is insecure, all right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we're not as probably far along as we want to be. That's okay. But don't compare your chapter one to someone else's chapter 20. Mm -hmm. and, but if you can allow the chapter 20 stories to sharpen you, you do leverage a biblical principle that says iron sharpens iron. That's what the two of you are doing on this podcast. It's what the two of you are doing with one another. Um, it's what you're doing with me. That's what the exchange was all about. Mm -hmm. And um, so keep moving forward. I, in fact, I was astounded to hear John Maxwell say at this event, I, I don't know if y'all remember this, when he said, I've never had a clear vision. I just kept moving forward. Yes. Ah, that was one of the best. <laughs> yeah. That was so freeing for me. I'm like, wait, wait, time out. John Maxwell's never had a clear vision because again, I'm comparing my chapter one to his chapter 372 yes. in terms of his 89 books he's written. Um, and I'm like, okay, so you've never had a clear vision. I feel so much better about myself right now. You know that. And when he said he had never actually read the Bible all the way through, I'm like, hallelujah. <laughs> horrible person. <laughs> I don't remember if that was when we were in Israel or where it was or on a podcast or on a something he did I'm like, thank you, Lord. You know, I love this. This is such an important piece. I, I know I notice as a leader myself when, when I'm willing to be humble and authentic and transparent, people remember that. And, and we have to remember how important that was to all three of us because we all three when we heard it, thought, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. You know, I feel like there's some hope, right? And people live for hope. <laughs> I, I've, I've quoted that maybe more than anything else <laughs> that I heard. Um, and I just, because uh, I, I've, I've shared that with, because I'm, you know, in these early startup days of the four company. And so I'm with other entrepreneurs. And when I said, hey, because they're feeling insecure, I don't have the clear vision. I'm like, well, let me tell you what John Maxwell said. So, <laughs> Uh, just keep moving forward. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I have I have a million questions, but I have two I for sure want to ask. <laughs> and I know Linda, you probably do too. Okay, so for time purposes, um, one the the first one is I want you to tell a quick story. I loved the story that you told about the CEO of Home Depot and how he wrote the handwritten notes. And you said something that stuck out to me, and I shared this with all of my teams, and I'm going to share it again today. Um, uh, and I want you to tell the story if that's okay, Jeff, real quickly. But you said uh, the bar is so low that it, honestly now that when somebody receives a handwritten note, they automatically think that it's like computer generated uh, yeah. because the bar is so low. So will you tell that quick story and then just like share your thoughts around that? Because I think that's really good for people to hear too. Sure. Well, Frank Blake was the CEO. He's, he's a retired CEO of Home Depot. He was the COO at the time. And uh, the board fired the current CEO and they called Frank on a plane and said, congratulations, you're the new CEO. And, and Home Depot was in a, in a, not a great spot. So he handed this company and uh, the two founders, Arthur Blank and Bernie Marcus are still around, but you know, they, they've moved on and he's never been a CEO. And it really is a remarkable turnaround story in terms of what he did. And so I was having breakfast with Frank and I asked him, which was maybe a bad question, 
But I said, if there was only one thing that you could tell me that turned that around, what would you tell me? And he, and he said, well, Jeff, you know, it's more than one thing. And I said, I know, but just if you had to boil it down to one thing, what would it be? And he would say, well, the handwritten notes that I wrote are Home Depot Associates. And I thought, and I said, really? Okay, handwritten notes, so tell me about this. Because I'm a big believer in handwritten notes, but to have a CEO of a multi-billion dollar company like this telling me that this was the cause of their turnaround, I was incredibly intrigued. And uh, he had a system. So he asked all the regions you know, around the world to send in stories on a weekly basis. And then he would sit in his study on Sunday and he would write these handwritten thank you notes. And he told me, Linda and Dana, that he averaged around 100 thank you notes a week, okay? Wow. Which is, you know, you, you, you look at that and go, you know, don't you have something better to do, you know? And, but, but he was telling me, it's, no, actually, this is the most important thing, encouraging the Home Depot associates, because it does go back to something Truett said. Um, and, and Linda, you mentioned, you started with this, is that, you know, the international sign of someone needs encouraging is if they're breathing. Yeah, love and that. Everybody at Home Depot was breathing as he's walking around the, the aisles. But the story he told me, which was both uh, wonderful and uh, a little depressing, was he went to a store one day and a Home Depot associate came up and said, hey, Mr. Blake, you wrote me a note. I'm so grateful for that, but could you write me another one? And Frank, let, Frank said, well, sure, but why do you need another one? And he said, well, you know, when I, I got your note, I was so impressed, I showed it to my wife and my coworkers, and they all said that this can't possibly be a real note. There's no way that Frank Blake wrote you handwritten note and if you put it under water um, it will you'll see that the ink won't run because it's computer generated and so he thought you know what that's probably true I don't know why I thought this was a real note so he put it under water the good news is is that the ink ran it was a real note um, the bad news is is that the ink ran it was a real note and he was asking for Frank to write him another note because the first one had been ruined and that's both wonderful, but it's also just a reminder that people are so surprised when you do something uh, humanely like that. Mm -hmm. And that's why I tell, tell uh, business leaders, don't forget the humanity of the business. I'm all for data. I'm all for spreadsheets. I'm all for being as effective as we possibly can. I'm all for cost management and profit and all of that. But at the end of the day, if we drive the humanity out of the business, um, we're gonna get to the end of our lives and have some regret. Mm -hmm. And what I love about what the two of you are doing is, and again, you gotta have profit. I'm a huge believer in profit, but I think profit and purpose can go together. And business leaders like Frank, um, again, a publicly traded company, right? And here's a CEO writing a hundred thank you notes a day, or a week. Um, but then when you ask him, what was the turnaround? It wasn't, well, there's this cost management system that we put in place, Jeff, or there was this one, you know, new way to open up stores or our online presence was this, all that's really important. But he said it was the handwritten thank you notes, which to me showed me that it is about ultimately the humanity of the business will win the day. Yeah. And humanity is so important in the times that we're in right now, because you're hearing so many stories of people struggling, struggling, being down, being low. You're like an emotional roller coaster with everything that's going on uh, right now. So uh, I, I believe this will be even more important as it has been in forever, but even more in 2021 and beyond. This is a season, uh, this, if you think of it from a harvesting standpoint, this yeah. is a season where you are sowing. And as you are sowing into the lives of your customers, you will reap the benefits. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you pull back from your team, if you pull back, and I understand it's a very, I'm not trying to make light of the difficulties that we're facing. We have to make, every business and organization has had to make some hard decisions. I totally get that. But I think you can even make those hard decisions and still sow within the life of your team and still sow good seed in the life of your customers and your, your community. And ultimately you will reap the benefit of that. Awesome. Love that. So, um, Danny, you have a, another burning question, I can tell. Yes, I have a selfish question. 
Uh, so anytime I get to ask somebody a, a selfish question, Linda and I are both the same, we will, because this is a true, this is a true struggle that I have. So I would just love your feedback on it um, okay. and appreciate your mentorship. So I grew up think, hearing and being taught that uh, you don't tell when you tithe. So like when you do good things, you don't really go and tell that story or, you know, you don't share that because you, that's not the reason that you're doing it. Um, and so in an effort to, to, to turn even some of my teams towards, and we do a lot for the community, to even make that our bigger focus for 2021 and tell that story. I guess my internal conflict is like, well, wait a minute, we're not really supposed to tell when we do all of the good things. And I also want people to know that that's what we're about and that's what we're for. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think that's a good tension to, to, to manage. I, I face the same thing in, in the okay. church. I mean, we, we were doing a lot of things in the church, but where I got around to that is if we do a, um, if we do a lot of great in the community and our church doesn't know about it, then we rob them of understanding what they can be a part of. Mm. And so I would, I would see this as, Hey, if you want to join us by serving this great organization, do that because here's what we're doing. So the emphasis isn't on what you're doing. The emphasis is on how you're supporting this organization, but you're actually sharing with people what you are, are, are doing. And um, I also believe um, that as you do that, for, for example, I have a, a, a business leader that I, I work with here in Atlanta. She serves um, a nonprofit and she posted about them online last week she posted about what she does for them. But the reason we felt good about that post was because she was sharing with people how they can also benefit this organization. Right. And the organization benefited from that because they weren't aware of what this organization did or even who the organization was. So there is a, there is a messaging thing there, Dana, um, but it wasn't look at what I'm doing. It's look at what this organization is doing here's how I'm helping them. Would you like to join in what, what they're doing? So you become the secondary message to that. Um, the other thing is I think it robs the team of understanding what, you know, the, the, the larger piece of, of all that. So, and again, I think that comes back to a hard issue. The fact that you're even asking this question makes me feel, makes me know that your heart's in the right place and you're going to be fine. So the fact that you're struggling with that tension is actually is, is a really good thing. Awesome. That helps yeah. a ton. Thank you. I, I love here's what we're doing to help and here's how you can be a part of that too. That's right. like the perfect just solution. Mm -hmm. Well, Jeff, as we kind of close up with our time today, is there any final advice or thoughts you would give our audience? Um, you know, the realtor community is a community that serves 24 seven most days, honestly. Yes. Um, you know, it's, it, it's not a, not a thing where you go home and go, well, I work today and now I'm done. You, you take people's issues and problems and, and you take them home with you, with you. And it's just, it's just a great, uh, number one, it's, uh, to me, it's the, one of the greatest industries still left in the world, but it's also one that our people really, really pour out and serve uh, people. Uh, what, you know, based on that, what would you, was there any last advice you would give them on, I love this thing. And I think any agent who adopted this, uh, as their mantra and constantly checked off to see how in line they are with what they say they're for and what are their customers think would the business would flourish. You wouldn't ever have to worry about the money. The money would just show up. Mm -hmm. uh, what would, what advice would you give them as we, as we close out here today? And then I'd also like for you to uh, end by uh, telling everyone, how can they learn more? First of all, I'm going to say, read the book because we didn't even get into the social media and that, that stuff is priceless that you talk about in there. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what, what last advice would you give them? And then where can they find you and follow you and, and figure out more about what you do? Sure. Well, I certainly can relate to serving like as, as real estate agents, you're really serving people because you get to know them, you know, yeah. for very, you know, and that, what, however that length of time is, and I understand that because as a pastor, rarely do people come up to me and call me and go, hey, I just want to let you know how great my day is going. Yeah. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't get a phone call. Hey, man, I'm having the greatest quarter. Let me tell you, it was usually crisis and all of that. So, um, so as you're serving and as you're pouring yourself out, you have to be replenished yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's why these two questions, the subtitle of the book is a great growth strategy for work, but an even better strategy for life because the two questions actually are more challenging and I think even more helpful on a personal basis. So for example, what do you want to be known for as a person, as a human being? 
Uh, what do you want to be known for? Um, if I were to ask, if I were to have a cup of coffee with one of your listeners and ask them that question, I'm hoping I wouldn't get a blank stare across the table. Um, if, if, if you, and that's one of the reasons I wrote, wrote the book, like we can help you with that. Um, but ultimately, if I were to tell both of you, I want to be a great husband and I want to be a great dad and I want to be a great, you know, leader. Ultimately, you have to go talk to my wife. You have to go talk to my kids. You have to go talk to the team I serve. You have to talk to the people in my life and go, here's what Jeff wants to be known for. Is he delivering on that? And um, there's going to be gaps in all of our lives. So one of the ways, one of the strategies I talk about in the book is to remain inspired. You have to fight for inspiration. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to get inspired. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is remaining inspired. Um, and like retreats, what you're like you're doing today, Dana is a big help help for that. Um, and I list some remaining in, you know ways to remain inspired. But for me, one of the best ways to do that, in fact, my key habit for 2021 is, um, and I've had this habit, but it's I, it's the one I'm going to pick for 2021. I'm reading this book, Atomic Habits. And it says that we don't rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our systems. Mm. That's and one of our favorite books. Jeff. We, we, oh. we were on a huge atomic habit kick. Was it, I guess it was last year, Linda. Was it last oh. year? Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing. Well, I'm trending about a year behind y'all. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, so, I, so in the book, I talk about a great day begins the night before. Mm -hmm. So I just know that when I, plan, dream, ideate, just for a few minutes about what I want the next, what, what I want to happen the next day, I have a better day. Mm. And the better days I have, the better weeks I have, the better weeks I have, the better months I have, and the better months I have, the better year I have. And, um, you know, I'm a little concerned, honestly, from a pastoral standpoint, that people are put, placing too much emphasis on 2021. Someone told me this week, I can't wait to count down midnight on December 31st of 2020. And I'm like, you know, I think 2021 will be better, but what if it's slower than you think? Mm -hmm. um, but what you can count on is what you can control. And what you can control is trying to shrink the gap between personally what you want to be known for and what you are known for. So I list seven strategies in the book to do that. It's not an exhaustive list, but I think, um, cause uh, you really wanna make sure that you're not just serving the business, but the business is serving you. Yeah. There are a lot of people who call themselves business owners. They're not business owners because the business owns them. That's so true. Um, and you have to own the business and the business has to serve you. And that's far easier said than done. But one of the ways that you own the business and not the business owns you is planning the night before, remaining inspired and bringing the best, most healthy version of you. And uh, I think the, one of the best things that you can do for your business is to be as emotionally, physically, and relationally and spiritually healthy as you possibly can. That's a fantastic business strategy. Beautiful. I love that. I love, it. love that. So Danny, how, any closing? How, no, I was just going to say, how can they find you, Jeff? How can they, uh, your website or in, your, I know you're on social media because we follow you, but how, how else can they find you? How all can they? Yeah, they can just go to uh, jeffhenderson.com and I would love um, for them to email me. If they get the book, my cell phone's in the back of the book and I've, I'm asking people to just text me and, and I've had so many, I get about a text or two a day from, from readers and it's been fantastic. They've asked questions or they shared with me how they've implemented the strategy and how it's benefiting their organization. So um, yeah, I would love for them to get the book, even if they just, even if they don't want to read, read it, just flip to the acknowledgements in the back, but just go to jeffhenderson.com. They can email me, um, but I would even prefer them to text me when they get my cell phone number uh, from the book. That's yeah, awesome. we love that. We took advantage of that, didn't we, Dana? Yes. <laughs> By the way, soon we're going to do a, a podcast on the topic of the be beauty of, of asking. Uh, and uh, so we're a testament to the fact that he actually answers the, te the text. And the book is small, but it's very, very powerful. And we will put a link to that in the bottom of our show notes 
uh, so that we can make it easy for you just to go grab that uh, book after you listen to this amazing podcast. And so Jeff, I just want to say uh, on behalf of Dana and I, thank you. Uh, we could l spend all day with you and it would never be enough. So hopefully we're going to see you again through the John Maxwell organization. And we hopefully can bring you to our people soon for your, some of your training uh, to take this even deeper for our people. Yeah. I hope so. It's great to see y'all again. And let's, let's make, let's get this on the books. I'm ready to go. Absolutely. So just remember, if you have a topic or a question or a guest that you think Dana and I would like to have or can help you with, or you'd like to hear on our podcast, be sure and reach out to us at info at everything life and real estate. And remember, the greatest compliment you can give Dana and I is to think of someone that you believe would benefit from these conversations that we're having here on everything life and real estate and pass our podcast along. So Jeff, again, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you uh, for what you do and thank you for what you share uh, and make the world better. We just uh, greatly appreciate you. Absolutely. And Dana, I'll talk to you, I guess, next week. Yes. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Talk to you later, Linda. Be sure to subscribe for more business strategies and tactics to inspire you to live an abundant real estate life. Don't forget to rate and review so we can bring you the best content. Find this and other valuable information at everythinglifeandrealestate.com.